But thanks a lot for having me here and thanks for coming. This is probably a repeat for most of you, isn't it? How many have been around me before? Anyone? No one? Oh, well, we're in for a treat then, aren't we? My name is Brian Stegelmeyer. I'm from Idaho. I was born in Logan when my dad was going to Utah State. And then he went to veterinary school and he practiced veterinary medicine in the upper Snake River Valley up Brecksburg. He went clear to up into the Little Loss and all up and through there, Driggs. So I, I'm very familiar with veterinary medicine and, and livestock production. And I'm excited to be able to tell you some of the work that we've done in the last 30 some odd years that I've been at the Poisonous Plant Lab. When they asked me to talk, they wanted me to talk on abortions and scours. And I told them, there's no way I'm going to do that. It'd be like listening to a 35 year old lecture from veterinary school. And I wouldn't want you guys to suffer through that. So what I thought we'd do today is discuss uh, poisonous plants and how to get a really good diagnosis if you have problems with poisonous plants, because these problems tend to be cyclic. Every couple of years, they'll rise up and, and it will be big and it will hurt. You know, 20, 30, even hundreds of animals can be killed at some times. And uh, so it's important to be able to have the tools to be able to deal with those. And I've been duly challenged since they moved me to this nice venue and they have the screen right behind me and there's no way I can hardly turn around and see anything. And I feel like the weatherman, you know, on TV or something. I've been duly challenged not to use slides. No, I, didn't I didn't challenge. I was challenged. I was challenged. not so, so part of it, I might just use a story. It will be fun. And, you, and then... We're going to go through the steps, the things you need to have to be able to get a really good diagnosis. And that diagnosis will lead you to how you might treat animals that are poisoned or might avoid poisoning later on. Okay. So the challenge is this. <clears throat> I was going to tell a story about historical story about our laboratory because our lab's been there for uh, over uh, almost 100 years. It started in Colorado and then and moved to Salina, Utah, and then finally to Utah State. And I, I moved there in 1990, and it was a metal shed. And I have a picture of that. I think if I can get this to change, it's not changing. Nothing's working. Fire the IT guy. He left. Yeah, right. Fire both of them. She says you got a coil froze up. How about if we all push some button? There we go. This is the, the lab where I started. It was a metal shed. We've updated. Okay. And this is the lab, the, the staff about 12 years ago, and, and it's a lot smaller now. So this is where I get to stand up here and beg that uh, perhaps if you see the good that we can do for the industry and for, for public health even, um, we, we need some support from some stockholders like you that uh, you're the ones that we're working for, okay? So now I'm going to talk about why we need to know about poisonous plants. And to do this, I want to share a story with you. And there aren't a lot of slides to this story, so you'll have to bear with me, okay? And it was about seven, eight years ago, and some producers over in Colorado called me, and, and they, they were running out of hay. And it sounded a lot like that last talk we listened to, you know. But he had an uncle that lived up in Wyoming. I won't say where nor their names. But uh, he had some hay, and it was on a pivot. It was fresh hay. And when, when, it, when they, they seeded it, the wind blew. Guess what? The wind blows in Wyoming. I've been there. In fact, I don't think it snows in Wyoming. I think God just dumps it on the border and blows that snow across the state. And it doesn't melt. It wears out. It wears that snow out. But uh, he lived up in Wyoming and the wind blew and it blew in a whole bunch of weed seeds into that, that new seeded alfalfa. And so they called me and, and how, you, none of you have ever called me, right? You know, you, you should know my number and you should call us and use us because he called and, and I said, you know, it could be poisonous, right? That alfalfa with all those weeds in there. And of course he called the, 
seed guy and he said, well, let's cut it and then we'll irrigate it and spray it because it was Roundup Ready alfalfa. So they cut it and then they piled that hay that they cut off of it over on the side and they had no intentions of using that hay because it was so weedy. And uh, so he called me and said, can we feed that hay? And I said, well, if you do, close your eyes and pray because it's dangerous, right? And what would he be worried about with that hay? Anybody have a clue? Huh? Halogeton, my nemesis, right? Yeah, halogeton, terrible. I hate halogeton. What are you doing? They want to see you. Tell them to go away. Tell them to come to the meeting. It's a beautiful day. Come to the meeting. I hear they're having tri-tip. You guys came just for the meeting. The meeting, huh? So, where was I? I was talking about what would be dangerous about that. And what when when you have new hay like that with a lot of weeds in it, and you've you're gonna let it grow as long as you can so it gets much seed out of uh, much of that seed to set in, right? And get some root, then you're gonna cut it. So you probably stressed it on top of that to get it to grow as much as it would. And then you cut it when it was stressed, and so it's gonna probably have nitrates in it. And and we nitrates were mentioned sooner. I said, well, I'd sure analyze it. Go out and test it and see. And we'll talk a little bit about testing and there'll be more testing to come after me. But so I said, you should test it and see. And it came back a little bit high in nitrates, but not bad. And the food quality was, it was a poor forage. And I said, well, be careful. Don't just go and dump it all on them at once. Just feed a couple bales. And you know, that's exactly what they did. They hauled. A couple semis of that hay down to, to Colorado where the livestock were, and it was cold. It was a really cold time of the year and, you know, like minus 10. And they fed six or seven bells is all. And the other hay that they fed was the, the grass hay that they had been feeding from that from their farm right there. And within hours, those animals uh, started dropping, getting sick. And, and... And so they pulled that hay that they had just fed. They did everything right, everything that I told them. And yet they still had problems. And we looked at that hay and it was probably 90% kosher. And I hate kosher weed because kosher has been my nemesis. Well, get problems like this will happen. About, about 150 animals were killed. And, uh, and so we try to study that. So we... Um, we right away they got the veterinarians to go over and, and, and work and they did some liver biopsies and they did some serum chemistries and uh, we did necropsy on a couple of them, ones that died and they had really bad liver disease. In fact, when I looked at the liver, I said, oh, that looks a lot like cockleburr because cockleburr is a real potent toxin, the cockleburr toxin. And so, I, you know, I had a kind of an idea what kind of plant we were looking for. And it didn't sound like kosher to me. So we, we uh, tested all those bales and looked through them and, and there was no cockleburr toxin in it. So we still didn't know what it was. So we brought those bales back to the lab and we tried to feed it to some cattle and they didn't want to eat it. And, and I even bought some cows from, from the site you know, that had survived the poisoning and they wouldn't even touch it. They were averted to that hay and so we didn't know where to go with it. We couldn't make them sick. We tried to grind it up and pump it into them and, and it didn't cause any problems. <laughs> yeah, oh, we'll do all kinds of things. If you don't think to try to reproduce that poisoning, right? So we can get a handle on what the toxin is. Finally, uh, we started looking at these cattle more closely because we were starving them down to try to get them to eat it. And, and they would sift through that hay and leave a lot of fines on the, in the bottom of the manger. And so we started collecting those fines and we, and, uh, we actually took those and, and uh, put them in the greenhouse and seeded them because there were some seeds in there and saw what grew up. And it wasn't kosher. The one that grew up out of there was a salvia, a mint plant that had gotten in there. And so we, we fed those fines back to cattle and were able to reproduce the disease where it caused liver disease. And then finally, we isolated the salvia toxins, the salvarian, and so we made this whole big circle, right? And it took every bit of three years for us to do all of that work. 
And, and my, my reason for giving you this example is, is how difficult it is sometimes to get a good diagnosis and how sometimes you just got to be lucky because who, who would have thought that we needed to feed the fines? You know, look at what the animals left in the manger and then, then feed that back to, to those animals to, to isolate that toxin. But we were able to do that. Now we know that that plant's poisonous and we can actually test animals. You know, if an animal's poisoned, we can collect some rumen material and test that material and, and identify the toxin from that. Any questions on that? So they're saying that that stuff ruined or whatever that quick? I mean, just in it was so fast. And cockleburs that way too. Right? That's a really potent alkylating agent that damages the liver. They're, they're tired of looking at me? No, I'm just moving this to try and get that to just There's a question on the chat too, asking that is how is cheese have 90 in the main concern of sodium and Okay, uh, did I say halogen? Because I, I meant kosher, right? Well, he asked you about how it, you know, you asked. I thought I said kosher because, you know, I kind of like halogen. Halogen is my friend. I know it. Right? Kosher, I hate because I never know what it's going to do wrong. And I, I can tell you that kosher accumulates nitrates. You know, and and there's uh, you'll see kosher poisoning all the time because you know Grandpa will be out there. He's got a dairy, right? And so uh, the whole farm's planted except alkali flats up there. You know, alkali flats, and so he's got no where to move the manure, so he puts it on alkali flats. And you go up there, there's probably three feet worth of manure on alkali flats. So what grows up there? Kosher weed, right? It grows good. Big. So when he's going up there to swath the hay, he thinks, ah, that's ugly. Look at that kosher standing up there. So he just swerves over there and mows down that hay. And then when he comes back with the baler, there's that hay in that windrow. You got to get that out of there. So he bales it up, and all of a sudden, you got half a bale of kosher. And that can be huge nitrate poisoning. And that's when you poison an animal. And so, you know, I know that kosher, I've seen it over and over again, will accumulate nitrates and be concerned for that. But all those other things that have been associated with kosher poisoning, you know, the oxalates and the sulfates, and some people even talk about endophytes in kosher, um, I, that hasn't ever panned out for us. And we haven't been able to prove um, that it was been associated with the, the disease outbreaks that have been associated with it. Because this is like the seventh big study that I've tried to do with kosher. And I, and, I struck out all seven times. It hasn't been kosher. And, and those others, I still don't know what caused some of those. And it's just tough. It's a challenge, right, for, for me as a scientist. And it should be for all of us, right, till we get a better handle. So now what I want to do is I want to talk about, uh, I'm going to jump through this good stuff that everybody else got yesterday. Isn't that cool? And talk about uh, poisonous plants and how we're going to come to a diagnosis. Because uh, animals are poisoned when they when they eat too much too quickly. And a lot of poisonous plants are pretty good forage, like the lupins and the larchers. Those are pretty decent. Uh, the trouble is when animals eat too much too quickly and they get a toxic dose. And so what makes it be toxic to, to animals? And usually if they have alternative choices, they'll, they'll do okay. But when we uh, force them into that situation like this, when, you, when you're feeding animals forages that have been prepared and they know that if they don't eat quick, they're not gonna eat. They'll, they'll eat stuff that they wouldn't generally eat. And this is where we see the majority of the cases in my experience now, okay? So let, I got a little list here of things that I think are important that we talk about today. And, and I'll give you some tools to maybe help you if you happen to be in a problem like this to, to make some good decisions. The first is a field or a field study, okay? And, and I'll show you some examples of that. And we'll talk about plant identification, how to sample, and how you might even prepare things if you needed help identifying something because it's always a challenge to identify plants. Trust me, I, I'm a veterinarian, right? And so when people bring me plants, I usually look for a, you know, a, taxon you know, a taxonomist type that's gonna be able to identify them, right? 
Now I want to talk about clinical disease and how important it is to, to collect the data from that. You know, how many animals were poisoned? What were they? Were they pregnant? Were they cow-calf pairs? What do you got? And then what were the clinical signs they developed when they were poisoned? And then we're going to talk about lesions because sampling is real important. And a necropsy, you know, everybody says, oh, it's so expensive to get an animal uh, necropsy and, and get, you know, that animal is probably your most valuable one if you can get a good uh, direction so you know what to do. So, for example, most plants have uh, a whole bunch of different toxins in them. And different plants have different toxins in them. And you just can't say, I would like to look for plant toxins. You need to have some direction because it would be a, a, almost impossible to test for all the toxins at once. And it would be very expensive. So you, you need to have some direction. And all of these things, they have lesions in those, the biochemistries, the biomarkers, they can tell us, okay, you need to look for salvarian, right? In the case of that first poisoning I presented to you. And then, and how do you interpret it? Because just because you find, it's, let's say you collect the sample and you find a toxin in there, that might not be what killed the animal. You know, animals often have plant toxins in their systems. They're just not at such concentrations that they're fatal. Okay, so you know where we're going? Are we ready? Okay, let's go. Did we make it? Animals die, don't they? And when they die, you need to go out there and make, you know, make a study of it. Now, sometimes we don't feel uh, qualified, right? So like, if you were to call and say, Brian, I need you to come out and identify plants, I'd say it isn't gonna happen. I'm not that good at that. I know the, the, the easy one and my phone does a better job of than I do. You know, they have these apps now that are pretty sweet, but uh, uh, you might need some help. Who might you call to help if, this, if you found this? Don't call him. He's the one that told me not to use slides. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you going to call? Well, you know, that's a really good choice. And, you know, to the man with a hammer, the whole world's a nail, right? <laughs> and I'm a veterinarian. and But veterinarians, especially the local ones, they have a pretty good idea what's there. You know, they, especially if they've been there a while, they, they can help you, right? Who else? Extension. Oh, you want to go there, don't you? You. Yes, he's an extension guy. You can tell him. Okay, our extension agents are really good. You know, at Utah State, I have extension agent students types. You know, they're going to go into extension, come and take my class every year. I uh, I teach a class every other year, and it's a lot of fun. And it, 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 it'd be worth the trip to Logan, but um, they they're really pretty good. They got some range studies, you know, and and, and so they they know how to do it. But like everybody, when you do this range study, you're not going to know all the plants. So we, we've got to have some options. So here's a poisonous plant right here. Who knows that? I know, I know. It's death damage, right? Well, which is more important, that one or that one? This one. Why is this one more important? What? Somebody ate it. Somebody ate it. And that, that's really critical. This field study, you can get an idea of what animals are eating. And uh, producers are probably the best people to, to identify what their animals are eating. They ought to be out there watching. And, you know, I'm working on a case from Florida where uh, these cows uh, get rumen atony. So it's the, the plant is killing the rumen, just, and it's really hard to keep those animals alive. Once you get the rumen killed, it's, it's tough. And, you know, and I send them out all these recipes for rumen, you know, that my grand, my dad and my grandpa gave me how to kick a rumen back and, you know, includes tobacco and things like that, you know. But uh, it's really, really difficult. And, and that the, those guys can tell. They say, look, we got this ardesia plant. It's a big bush that has berries. And, and they're they're eating it hard, and then they get trouble. So, you, you know, you guys are probably the best ones to to come up with this. But if not, and if you can't identify all the plants, we should collect them. And you're going to collect the plant, you know, like this one. We all know that. I don't need to collect it, do I? That's larkspur. But this one, I might not know. That's a senecio, senecio hydrophylloides, and 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 uh, you wouldn't know that. I remember. 
when I first came to the lab, Kip Panner was uh, one of the veterans there. And he, he and I went on a road trip to look at a, a poisoning. And, and I thought, oh, good. Finally, I'm going to learn some poisonous plants. Because in, in veterinary school, I think it was like 10 days that we studied poisonous plants. And that was all. And so we drove by a plant that looked kind of like this. And I asked Kip what that was. And he said, it's an ADC. I said, what's an ADC? Does anybody know? Another damn composite. <laughs> and, and his point was, you know, a lot of these plants look very, very similar. And, and uh, so you really need to get some help. And so what, what you should do is you should collect that. And if you haven't got time, you can put them in a paper bag and they'll keep for a little while. But the best thing to do is put them between a couple pieces of paper like this and press them like under some books. And once they're pressed, then you can tape them onto a piece of cardboard and, and mail them where you, wherever you'd like. And that will give you the best chance of getting a good identification on that plant. So on a field study where we go out and look, you know, even uh, the range scientists and me when I go with them, which isn't that often, right? They don't like to let me out. Uh, we'll, get, we'll come home with 15 or 20 plants that we'll want to have identified. And so we get help. And the people we use are at the Intermountain Herbarium there in Logan. And they really like us because we um, make good preps. So we can make these voucher specimens, they're called, and they love those. And so if I make them three or four extra vouchers, they won't even charge us to look at their stuff. So you could send them to them or to any, inner, you know. And in the paper, I think they were gonna print out a paper that summarizes this information. That there's uh, links on there to find your barriums that in, in your state if, if you're worried about that. Any questions on that? Okay, so sampling plants is important. Now, this is to, for identification. And uh, some poisonous plants, we know they're poisonous, but they're not always toxic. The concentration, concentration, uh, that's kind of repetitive. The concentrations vary. For example, when I first started, I wanted to study Plants that cause liver disease, call, uh, and these plants are uh, contain a toxin called pritolizine alkaloids. And the reason I like that plant is because uh, for my dissertation work, I did a lot of work with cancer. And these toxins are carcinogenic. And in fact, I'm just finishing up my last study. Wow, that was pretty crucial. Studying the, the carcinogenicity of these toxins, these pritolizine alkaloids in a transgenic model. It's really kind of a cool study and it would be fun to talk about that, but we won't. Anyway, my point is I, uh, we, I wanted to collect this plant and I went to um, Nebraska and collected, it was Senecia rodellii and it had 14% rodellin in it, which is amazing. You could almost squeeze the plant and drip it out of it, right? And I thought, wow, I'm gonna be rich because this is worth lots of money. And so I went back the next year to collect it again in the same place, in the same phenotype. You understand what that means? So it was in the flower at the same stage, and it was 0.3%. So it went from 14 to 0.3% rudelling. And, and that's just fantastic. And, and other plants are the same. Okay, so some of the lupins, right? And, and in a minute, I'm going to ask you which ones you want to talk about, because I'm going to use a few examples of these plants that to uh, tell you about a diagnosis of those, of those diseases. Um, lupins, some of them are teratogenic and some of them aren't. You know, and they're the same genus and species. In fact, a lot of lupins, when I take them in to get them identified, they'll say, where did you get it? And I said, that's not fair. <laughs> you, you shouldn't be able to do that because they'll, they'll want to give it a, a, a species on location instead of phenotype which I think is cheap. It's like, uh, you know, you wouldn't have a pathologist do that, right? I should have. Okay, let's go on. Now let's talk about testing because sometimes you're gonna to have to test samples to look for plant toxins in them. And, and, it's, a, and, a, and it's a real challenge, especially in, in forages like hay, right? Because hay, the contamination isn't uniform. And those weeds don't grow all together and mixed in, you know. When we talked about nitrates, we talked about testing for nitrates. Well, yeah, you can test haze using things like this, right? 
And if that doesn't work, you want to use one like this, right? And isn't that cool? I saw that in Australia, and he actually hooks it on the front of his pickup and drives into a big bell. And then this bag just gets filled up with sample. I'm not sure it's any better than the little one, because in fact, um, you, what are you sampling? And and we got what uh, Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, it will come to me. It's good to talk about sampling, but you know you, you're just getting little tiny pieces, and if if you do it the wrong way, you'll get it from one little leaf. If you do it the right way, you'll get you know a little bit from a whole bunch of leaves and. And that might work for nitrates. And with nitrates, if they are high, what do we tell you? We're going to tell you, well, feed it with something else so that it's diluted, so it's not, you know, so poisonous. And that's difficult to do if you're using a round bale or something like that. With you, if you can grind it up and feed it, it's a lot more safe. But you you see these problems with with different poisonous plants. And and uh, for example, the lupins. We test a lot of lupins for people. And if you have lupin on your range, I would certainly sample it and send it in and get an idea of what you're dealing with. Because if it is one of those that has those those teratogens in it, it's gonna affect how you handle, how you manage your, your herd. Any questions? Okay. So we're talking about sampling these and then we're gonna test for, for plant toxins. And remember, we sampled those bales from, from well, that poisoning from Colorado. And we didn't find toxins. We didn't find nitrates. We didn't find any of that. We had to finally sort through and let the, and I, we actually let the cows sort through and get those, those spines that were left in the manger to help us to identify those poisons, okay? And this is just to point out that this is the Senecio. This is one of the uh, Im imported Senecios that will take over fields and pastures in the Northwest. It's Senecio jacobia. And it has those toxins that I like to study that are perlesine alkaloids. And so if you send in a bale to me, uh, you know, and I like that, right? Because I'll go through the bale and look for, and it's hard to identify the plant because it's all <coughs> smashed up. But then I usually just take it home and feed it, right? It depends on the animal too, whether they're going to get poisoned. A lot of animals are very resistant to poisoning. Goats are pretty resistant. Who cares, right? <laughs> it's really tough to identify plants in, in, in dried forages like this. It's a lot better to go out to the field and look at it. Usually before that first cutting is the best idea and see what's in it. See what you're buying. Okay. So we can sample them and test for these alkaloids. And this is Del Gardner. He's a chemist in our lab. And these are some plant toxins that cause myelin necrosis in some plants. And, and he can give you a, a, an idea if it's there. We can use those same methodologies to test animal samples like serum, rumen contents, and tissues. And so we, we get a lot of mileage out of Dale. Now I want to talk just a minute about animal signs and, and describing the disease. And, and I'm putting this picture up there just to point out to you that it's really good to get it from the owners because they're the ones looking at the animals every day. And they're the ones that can say, yes, this animal's acting different. And this is the way it's walking. You know, it's there. This is what's changed in their demeanor, those kind of things. Do you understand? So what's wrong with this goat? Does anybody have an idea? No fair, you were here yesterday. She's not gonna tell you. Does it look normal? Besides having those EKG leads on it, right? That's because we put it on a treadmill and ran some stress tests on it. Can you see how it's posted up? Look at the hawks on that goat. You know, they're just posted straight up. And then the reason they do that is because they walk around like stilts, you know? Because their their muscles hurt, and so it, the things that you I, that, that you can identify and, and give them to your veterinarian and give them to your diagnostician, you know your pathologist, those will help us to better understand the disease. Then uh, you can you can take blood samples. We can look at different panels in the blood that give us an idea about organ function. You go to sleep, and I'll make fun of you. Don't do it; it will hurt. He's going to sleep anyway. We can do necropsies. There he woke up. 
And, and this is probably the most important thing, in my opinion, but I told you about the hammer, right? Um, people will say, well, necropsies cost money, and they do. And uh, we should work as a group together to try to get um, some help with that. You know, like there are some states, Arizona, down along the Arizona Strip, they have what they call it, the, the alert system. And if they have a big outbreak, they'll get the state involved, and there's monies to help defer some of the costs of these diagnostic tests. And uh, and plus, they bring all the experts on right in the start. It's a lot, a lot of fun. You know, they bring bring me in all the time. Okay? But necropsies are important, especially. So, like, your, knee, your, your veterinarian could do a necropsy, right? In fact, a lot of users can do that. And, and don't be afraid to open up an animal and, and get me a piece of le liver, right? If I say, oh, we should look at the liver. That's, that's a, a, good, a good thing to be able to do. And, and I know that you have the skills to do that. It's, don't be afraid to, to go after it. And I don't want to talk about that. So this is an example of a liver that was from an animal that was poisoned with selenium. So it ate a bunch of sel seleniferous plants and it caused massive liver necrosis. And this means a lot to me. And I love to show pictures like this because I'm a veterinarian, but this is going to give us direction where we go with this test, right? So if you saw an animal with the liver to look like this, you'd certainly want to analyze that liver for selenium, wouldn't you? You want to do some other things that help narrow down that list of the possibilities of what it might be. And rumen contents is a great sample. Okay, not only to, to, to do chemistry on and determine if it has alkaloids in it, but also to examine it, see what's in there. <laughs> And a lot of the cases of, of you poisoning are diagnosed human, using rumen analysis, just looking at the rumen sample. And if you'll see here, this is the sample from the poisoned animal. And you can see these leaves. This is that Japanese you. And they're very, very poisonous. And just a handful will kill a cow. And usually it happens when somebody trims their bushes around their house and then throws the clippings over and, and into the pasture. Okay. So that's a really good uh, sample. And we can analyze them. We have all these chemistries and enzyme assays to look at what concentrations of distant toxins in there. If we know what we're looking for, we might be able to find it. So once you've done all that, then we put it all together. We're going to come up with a, a best idea of what caused it. What was the, the most likely cause? What, what made the animal sick? Uh, give us a definitive diagnosis. This is the picture of a horse that's poisoned on local weed. And we're just showing you that that horse doesn't want to back up because it, it really doesn't have very good proprioception. And it's almost impossible to get him to back up. And so we'll put all that together and we'll say, this is most likely uh, local weed poison. And to, to have a definitive diagnosis, you just have to do all of that together until you finally say, okay, that's the poison. And how does this help us? This is an example of Larkspur that I wanted to show you. Because once you know it's Larkspur poisoning, there's things you can do to prevent poisoning. And, and what I've got here is a graph. This is the toxicity of the Larkspur, and this is the palatability. And so what we've outlined is a, an area, a time, when animals are most likely to be poisoned. So here, they just don't eat enough. And here, the plant isn't poisonous enough. And so if you graze early or graze late, Sometimes you can get away with it. And with different poisonous plants, there's different things like that. How much time do we have? 11.25? Five minutes? About seven or eight. And <laughs> this doesn't leave us much time, okay? So what I wanted to know is what, what ones would you like me to talk about? What poisonous plant would you like to learn a little bit more about? Whoa, lots of I'm done. Hey, yes, sir. Broom snakeweed. Broom snakeweed. I hate broom snakeweed almost as much as kosher. Because when uh, I got to come back here so they hear better. Huh. Um, when I started the lab, uh, Lynn James, the, the leader, he could talk the leg off that table. He was an amazing man. He would filibuster you until you died. <laughs> He, uh, he was convinced that broomweed caused abortion. 
And we pumped broom wheat into the cattle forever, trying to get cause abortion. You know what it causes? It causes rumen acne. It kills rumen. It's got a bunch of ABA taint type acids in it that are just toxic to protozoan bacteria. And so I had a lot of experience of um, transformation and all that kind of stuff to try to treat rumen acne, but it doesn't cause abortion. And it's a terrible range. A plant that displaces quality forages, and you know, you look at the studies, and uh, we don't want broom weed, but it's not the poisonous plant that Lynn wanted it to be. And finally, finally, after 20 years, I talked them into getting it off of our list. You know, we had this list, and, and you guys should contribute to that. If you have problems, you know, let us know so that it gets on our list of things that we need to be studying. And I want to bring weed God. And it finally got, it took me 20 years to get it off that list because somebody would always <clears throat> bring it up again. And, and, and every case that I've studied, you know, epidemiological ways, because I'm the veterinarian there, and so I had to deal with all, a lot of different things. Every case, they had other problems besides broom weed. You know, it would be down in Texas and places like that where uh, they, they had. DVD big time, you know. What's what's the abortion rate going to be if you've got endemic, you've got BVD persistent carriers? Does anybody know? Three to five percent. Because those new cab, you know, those new heifers and freshen, they're gonna be the ones. <coughs> I hate rumbling. I don't want to study anymore. You got a question? No, no, there's, a, there's a few questions online. Well, they should have come to the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help that, but I can related questions to you. One, one of them that has to do with um, your thoughts on grazing sweet clover. And the, the entire thing says, I know moldy sweet clover A is an issue, but you hear a lot about negative impacts on reproduction from grazing clover. Any truth to it? I don't know. Uh... You know, I'm familiar with the toxicity and uh, uh, estrogenic potential of some of those plants, but uh, I don't know. There's a lot of sweet clover around and a lot of good eat. They killed a bunch of cows on Yellowstone. <laughs> and? <laughs> You know, a lot of that stuff you see on TV isn't true. You hear it. <laughs> if you really want to kill some things, you could visit with me. <laughs> I would be very careful because it grew some violent deaths. But no, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I can't. So, you know, if, if you had some animal poisoned with it, give me a call. You know, how many people call up and say, what about this plant, Brian? And I'll look through my, my files and my, um, and I'll say, well, I have no record of it being toxic. But that doesn't mean it isn't. You know, everything depends on the dose and the animal, right? Because different species are, have different susceptibility. For example, I mentioned several times large bird. You guys all know large bird, right? You know which animals are susceptible to large bird poisoning? Just cows. Not the, the sheep. You know, that song about how the sheep and the cowmen should be friends. Sheep, you can pump. and You have to almost kill that sheep to get a high enough dose to kill a little archer. And because the receptor is on there, and there, there are receptors that are effective, and the sheep are much less, uh, they have a lower affinity, so they don't find the toxin as tight as cattle do. And so... Um, you know, and we have advocated, you know, and I have over here some pamphlets and things for a couple different plants, and they're all available online. You can Google us, you know, and, and, and find them there. But, you know, they did advocate using sheep as uh, a method to use those, those um, rangelands that are heavily infested or, or heavily populated because those are native plants, right? With, with large. So, while you're on the Larkspur topic, this question I know you answered yesterday, however, 
Does it do any good to bleed animals that uh, are possibly large for poison? Man, what did I ask for yesterday? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> May have said, hell no. But people, people, uh, people do things and then they, they'll actually get, I call it a testimony of that. I, I gave a talk once in the new compadres, and I, I mentioned this yesterday. This guy told me how he would grab the cow and, and cut her tail like this so that she would bleed. You know, there's big arteries back there. We use them quite often in veterinary medicine to bleed animals when we can't restrain their head. We'll do a tail bleed, you know, right under the tail. And uh, he cut it like this, and he said, you could hear the gas rushing out of the, of the vein as well. Are you sure it came out of the vein? <laughs> <laughs> then uh, you could tell he had dislike for me, and I, I don't want you. To, I don't want you to dislike me, but uh, there's no evidence. There's nothing in the physiology, of pathophysiology, of how that plant uh, poisons animals and how it kills them that says that uh, bleeding is going to help. You know and haven't we passed that back in the Middle Ages when they used to do that with people? And they would re release the humors from their bodies that were bad and let the good humors in. And uh, I'm not going to go there. I'm not good for, for, for bleeding. It's not good for essential oils. <laughs> Sorry, acupuncture. No, it happened. I have lots of stories about that. You don't want to hear them now. We're out of time. So, so one more question on my. It has something about what's the to, to mix nitrate. If you have hay with nitrates, what should the mix be to make that safer? Okay, it's kind of like cutting dogs' toes, right? Yeah. Yeah, has anybody ever say how short do you clip their toenails? And what do you tell them? They bleed. You tell them until they bleed and then back off a little. Okay. Now there are published some, you know, so like. And, and I don't know those offhand, but I could pull it up, and so could you, right? Correct. If if you wanted, that it says, you know, if you have, and and our chemist, he likes to report things in percentages instead of parts per million, and it's not a hard conversion, but you know, you can look at it and say, okay, I probably need to feed half and half, but I, I'm I'm warning you that in, unless you can mix it, mix it well, you're still uh, you're still having trouble. Now, uh, nitrates is, is, a, is a neat kind of disease, neat for a pathologist, right? Who likes to talk about things like that. In that, you know, it, it's not so much that it uh, oxidizes hemoglobin, but it, it really can cause some terrible abortion storms. And so if, if you come into an abortion storm, that's where you ought to start thinking first, is, is with nitrates. And and I had I had that on 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 the slide here. Look at all the cool things we could have talked about and instead of wasting time talking about damn kosher and here it is. Okay, so abortion storms big, and this is the sample you really want to submit. The globe, the entire eyeball, because that's kind of a protected area, and that will stay. That nitrate will stay in there longer. And so if you get, if you have an abortion, it's so like uh, for pine needles, I'm going to want thoracic fluid to test for the toxin from pine needles. And all that toxin will do is it'll tell me that the cow ate pine needles. It doesn't mean that she aborted from it. It could be something else, right? So we need to look at the whole case. But uh, with nitrate, that the globe, the, the aqueous portion of the, the this part of the, the globe, that's a really good thing to trust. Okay. And don't feed too much or they'll abort. Yeah. Can you get that aqueous humor while the animal's still alive? I wouldn't. Yeah. You're dealing with their vision and I mean that that that'd be you know, we do we, we do things like that in veterinary medicine when they're anesthetized and and if we want to collect some fluid from the and the aqueous from the start the, the from the anterior chamber. To do psychology if we're worried about cancer or something like that and that's cool but um to grab a sample that they're going to want to test for nitrates that wouldn't work 
it would be better to test your feed then, you know, or rumen contents aren't, aren't very good post mortem for nitrates. Any other questions? Am I done? Yes, sir. Um, so could you talk a little more about like you can read some of the uh, like side effects of like overdosing on it and uh, possible like treatment after having guys exposed to a large batch of it? Okay, now which toxic plant? I would lupin. Lupin? Yeah. Okay. Uh, lupin's a good good story too. I haven't done one on that. Okay. And, and uh, I think we're you want me to talk about lupin or I'll be done. This is so lupin, uh, lupin has a, a variety of toxins. They're all alkaloids. That just means that the chemistry has a nitrogen in it, right? And uh, the one that lupin means is the one, the big one. That one kills sheep usually. And they'll get poisoned when they go along and eat the pods. Because the pods and the seeds have really high concentrations. But in cattle, it, it rarely poisons them fatally. So it's going to poison them if they eat lupin during a susceptible period of gestation, and that's like 25 to 100 days of gestation. And that's when the fetus is most susceptible in, in, in the womb, most susceptible to develop uh, birth defects called appendicular and, and axial birth defects, crooked calf disease is what we call it, because they'll be born with scoliosis and kyphosis and all those other deviations of the spine, and they'll have crooked legs, Right, and if it's bad enough, they'll, they'll have trouble being born, dystocia. Okay, and so uh, is there a treatment for that? You know, it's a neuromuscular blocker, just like Larkspur, a, a little different receptor, but kind of like that. It blocks those, so it's fetal movement that gets damaged, and so it sits in there and, and can't move properly and develops poorly and with these deformities. So we don't have a treatment. What we have is uh, prevention, right? How would you do it? Keep them out of the loop and during that susceptible period. Or if you have to use that forage, use it with something that's not susceptible. And sheep aren't susceptible, deers aren't susceptible, you know, feeders, you know, growers, type animals. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um... I do have about that. So before I tried to uh, I think lupin is really high in either um, nitrogen or potassium. Can't remember. Uh, but we were given a supplement for that with a high amount of that. And I wasn't around to see how well it worked, but it's something like that hurt like you have to have. Okay, yeah, lupin, and, lupin is a lagoon and it's a good forage in, in a lot of parts of the world. If they don't have lupin, and if they don't have fiddle mac, they'll starve. Talking about Washington, you know, in the Scadlands, places like that. So a lot of animals eat a lot of lupin, and uh, it's usually pretty good. Maybe we should speak later. Yeah. Thanks a lot for your time.